Welcome to the VCE Music Performance Online Oral Training Rhythmic Transcription Slash Dictation Presentation Part 1 with Yolette Stewart. This clip has been designed to help my 2020 VCE Music Performance students during a time when they have been required to remain home, but I do hope it has some relevance and durability past this point in time. The contents of this clip were created by me, Yolette Stewart, and the activities here assume some prime musical knowledge, as does the VCAR Music Study Design. In spite of the assumption of prior knowledge, I will do my best to work from a back to basics precept, and I hope that this will support you in your learning with oral training at home. I now refer to the contents of the 2017 to 2021 VC Music Study Design. Just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to pull up my laser. That's up here, that's our accreditation period with a VCAR study design. So 2017 to 2020 from page 20 onwards. I have included the link to the PDF of the VC Music Study Design for your benefit in case you are not familiar with it. On page 20 of the study design, you will find what is called a music language chart. This chart clearly delineates the expectations of the oral component of this course. If you have not yet read through this chart, I strongly encourage you to do so. Whilst your VCE music mark will be built on your end of year performance examination, and we all know that contributes 50% to your overall grade, the oral component is very demanding for some students and needs a lot of work, rework and attention. Here is a VCAR devised list of the rhythmic configurations you are expected to know and transcribe from page 22. We are going to begin doing rhythmic work using only the contents of the first box for now. It's not a complete list. If you read the document itself, the VCAR study design, you will see the entire list there. I've only cut and paste the first box here. You can see that in simple time signatures such as 2, 4, 3, 4, and even 4, 4, I'm just about to pull up my laser pointer here. Your 2, 4, 3, 4, they haven't got 4, 4 here. These are just examples. You have the basic crotchet, the beamed quavers, the beamed semiquavers, the quaver followed by the two semiquavers, the two semiquavers followed by the quaver. On the second system here, or the second line, you have a syncopated configuration, the semiquaver followed by quaver followed by semiquaver. Then you have a dotted quaver followed by the semiquaver a semiquaver followed by the dotted quaver again, and of course the triplet here. Can I just point out that when students engage with rhythmic transcription, they often get rather excited because they think they can hear the, the group of the four semiquavers, but uh, some students forget to put in the second beam. Can I please stress that you do not forget your second beam because if you forget the second beam, your answer is technically incorrect. So you won't receive full marks, although an examiner might be able to see that you've got a sense of a semiquaver across one beat. Right, I need to really stress that for you. Thank you. Right, I will talk about this a little bit further, but you can see from this list that there are four configurations here. That's this one. That's the quaver followed by the two semiquavers, and then the next one along, which is the two semiquavers followed by the quaver, and then the first one on the second line, which is that syncopated configuration again, and then the triplet. These four configurations have three sounds or three notes per beat. This is going to be useful later for grouping because if you're not a student that's currently yet strong at identifying any one of these four configurations, that might be something to help you. That's just a little trick to help you use a process of elimination when you have to identify the rhythm that's on a particular beat. Here on this slide, what I have is a list that I have put together of all the common rhythm names we find in music education, particularly Kodai music education. I have created this list using the free music software program called MuseScore. These rhythm names are useful when performing rhythms out loud, which you should be doing with the use of your VCE music workbooks. Hopefully you have a designated VCE music workbook. My guys use the Sarah Soli series due to historical practices at the school, please practice the clapping rhythms in your VCE music workbooks as much as you can. Performing rhythm and also melody, which will come under another presentation at another stage, is just as important as transcribing rhythm and melody. 
Please note that if you run a brief search on the internet for rhythm names, you will find that a number of different naming systems or terms are in place. Pick the one that suits you for private home practice. I find that in a class setting, though, it's better if we can all use the same system for consistency. So if you have a look here on the first system, you're not likely to encounter the semi-brave, the dotted minimum or the minimum in a rhythmic transcription, largely because this is these these configurations are deemed a little bit too easy and can be confused easily with other rest indicators. That's not part of the brief here. You need to be focusing on these particular rhythms from bar 5 to 10, 11 and 12. Okay, so you've got your TT, your, that's the two quavers joined together, your ticker ticker, your four semi-quavers being together, not forgetting the second beam, your T ticker. As a quaver, so it's a longer sounding note followed by two short, quick ones. T ticker, T ticker, T ticker, T ticker is how that's you know, performed. And next one is ticker, T ticker, T ticker, T. It's the same as this one, but back to front basically. So it's a two semi quavers followed by the quaver. Final system here, you've got your triple T. Some children like to say the word pineapple, pineapple, or triple T, triple T. The important point about the triple T is that the three quavers are spread evenly across the beat during performance. This one here, the tim ka tim ka tim ka tim ka sounds like a horse galloping down a street. So you've got tim ka tim ka tim ka tim. This one is the opposite or the reverse of the tim ka. It's a ka tim, ka tim, ka tim. It's a semi-quaver followed by a dotted quaver, whereas the tim ka was the dotted quaver followed by the semi-quaver. And, of course, your final configuration here. Some people use the term taka, ka, taka, ka, taka, ka, taka, or I prefer this one, takami, 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 because to my way of thinking and to my way of performing, the three different sounds make it easier to perform. Good O. Next slide. Right, on this slide, what you will have just heard is an example of how we're going to work in this particular presentation. So what I've been learning about the narration facility in PowerPoint presentation is that it doesn't provide you with the embedded audio, and I do have an embedded MP3 here for students to work with. It doesn't provide it during the course of narration, but it provides it in the final summation when you're creating the video and you upload it somewhere. So uh, that's why I have to wait a moment because this slide will perform this first. If you have a look at what I've got up here, folks, you can see I'm using what's called a percussion clef. You are expected to be familiar with transcribing rhythms and, and melodies on, um, we're just talking about rhythms here. Um, obviously, you can't transcribe a melody on a percussion clef, but you need to understand the difference between pitch here, right? So this is what we call your counting bar, and you'll hear that. It, and because it's above the middle line there, the pitch is a little bit higher. The rest of the four bars will be your actual rhythm that you need to transcribe. And you can see here how it's all grouped together. You need to study the grouping, and you need to be able to visually uh, break each bar into its constituent parts. So if you're working in 4-4, four, four, that means you need to be able to visually allow space for each beat in the bar. The more you do of this, the more you get used to that. You've got to think aesthetically and artistically because I, I talk a little bit on another slide here about sketching in your rhythm on each hearing that you undertake. So this is an example, therefore, of how the rhythms will work on this particular presentation. You will see a page that will come up. It will give you an instruction. It will say, here is the audio. You just simply read that. You rewind the YouTube clip as many times as you need to to get your transcription down. You, you will need to have manuscript paper on hand. Your VC music book should have some spare uh, sections or elements that involve manuscript there, so please use those. There's heaps of free manuscript around on the internet. You can find it and use it that way if you want. Alternately, you can download MuseScore or even use NoteFlight and print some of their pages off if you want, and that way you've got a never-ending supply of manuscript. So this is very much a hand-to-paper task, and you therefore you can't use a digital way of answering this. You need to have clear notation skills. You cannot get around that. So just on that point, if this is your counting bar, you can see these notes here sit above 
the line. These ones will sit below. It's consistent. You need to aim for consistency. You could have written the answer here on the middle line if you wanted to, right? But you need to, what whichever position you choose to put your note on or in needs to be the same the whole way through. See how the beams are all appropriately managed here? I mean, obviously, I've used MuScore for this, so it looks really lovely and neat. But um, it, you've got to still be guided by the same principles and precepts when you actually write your rhythm down on a piece of manuscript. All right, so bear that in mind. That's the model for all the remaining samples on this PowerPoint presentation. So you'll always get that type of example with the counting bar first, and you will need to allow for four bars of transcribing. Let's move forward. Just a little point here before we move forward. This is a, a, a technique some rhythm transcribers use, particularly when they're trying to work out a melody. They will write an upright stroke to represent each beat of the bar. So we're working in 4-4 here, the time signal has been cut off here in this example, but this is clearly 4-4. So for each beat in the bar, you have this vertical line that represents the beat. And then um, you, you would sketch these vertical lines in quickly before you commence your transcription exercise. And as you go through, you just write a little dash across that vertical line to represent the number of sounds that you hear per beat, sounds or taps or pulses, whatever. Okay, so for example, with this one, the third beat of the second bar here, you've got four slashes across the upright vertical beat to represent four semiquavers. So you know that that answer for that beat has to be a group of four semiquavers. This one, you've got three uh, slashes across the upright line. And then it, it goes back to that point before, if you're not strong on rhythmic dictation yet, and I put that qualifying word there, yet, um, then you you have a process of elimination to work with here, right? You've got four of those, those four configurations I spoke about before. You've got one of those to pick from. Now, it has to be this one, ticker T, because in performance, of course, it's you've got two notes closer to the start of the beat and a quaver held a little bit longer in the second half of the beat. Okay, I hope that's a useful technique for you to use. If you're not already familiar with that, please do use it. It can be quite um, helpful. Right, just some general tips on rhythmic transcription. Number one, since you will usually get six playings of the said rhythm in a VCE music exam, and the only way you're going to get thoroughly familiar with that, folks, is to actually pull up and pull out the uh, VCAR website with all the practice exams or past papers. You need to be pulling them out and practicing them and rerunning them again and again and again and getting your teachers to mark them up all the time for you. Um, so you'll, you'll realise you usually get about six hearings. You need to aim to sketch in the elements of the rhythm you think you hear on each play. Number two, you would, for example, aim to sketch most of bar one in on the first playing and possibly the final contents of the final bar. When you sketch in your rhythm, try to be aware of the space in each bar. I did mention that not too long ago. Leave room for all the beats in the bar, please. Number three, on the second playing, review what you did in bar one to see if it is correct and now focus on the second bar. On the third plane, you focus on bar three, the fourth plane, bar four, and so on, using the final planes for checking apology. Number four, some of you will be with, familiar with the system of notating using the stick figures. That's, this is basically the, the system I explained on the previous page. So you can use that to guide your rhythmic transcription. Please use it if you think it's going to help you. Number five, and I can't underscore this enough. enough. Um, I get my words a little confused sometimes, just bear with me. Remember, success comes with constant immersion in the activity. That applies for melodic dictation as well. I tend to pound the rhythmic transcription first to build the confidence, and we pound usually intervals and the scales and, and modes recognition in my classes first. So we've got some working knowledge of the melodies we'll be dealing with. And we've got the working knowledge of how to write down the rhythm before we get on to melody. So if you can try and get some security and some skill with your rhythmic transcription, get this up. Um, these questions are often allocated quite a lot of marks in the final end of year exam paper. So you might find it's worth eight marks or 12 marks or 16 marks. That's a lot of marks. So uh, most students I work with will make considerable progress on rhythmic transcription in a short period of time if they apply themselves. The melodic transcription is, is the difficult one, all right, because that entails 
a lot of other interesting skills. All right, let's move on to the next page. Now, what will happen when we start these examples? You'll see a little white box and it will tell you what to do. Just listen to the example as many times as you need to by stopping the clip and rewinding it. Okay. And then on the, the next slide, don't be too quick to get onto the next slide. The very following slide will have the answer for you and I'll talk about the answer. So I think we're now ready for our first example. You need to have manuscript out sharpened pencils, rubbers, you need to allocate four bars in 4-4 four, four time signature, right? So the next few examples we're working with are basically all in 4-4. Four, four. And uh, I will just pre-prepare you here. We shall then be moving on to some basic 6-8 compound transcriptions as well. Thank you. Good. I hope that that was clear and audible for you. The answer will now be on the next slide. Please don't be too quick to go to that slide. I'm, I'm encouraging you to use this kind of presentation to be able to rewind as many times to really nut out your answer. All right. So moving on to the next slide for the answer. And here is your answer. Note that the transcription is four bars in length, not including the counting, right? I did explain that clearly before. That's your counting bar. It's, it's um, assigned at a different pitch there. And this was your answer. And you can see you've got some triplets in there and you've got some ticker T's in there. Triple T's and ticker T's. So there's quite a good balance here of um, rhythmic configurations that had three sounds per beat. Your groups of semiquavers. Right, so this is a way for you to think about marking this. Give yourself a mark out of 16. Make each bar worth four points. If you got a beat correct, then that's one point. If you got it half correct, it's half a point. All right, so see how you go. You want to be aiming for about 9, 10 out of 16 for the moment. And as you keep doing more exercises, building that up. So you're always sitting around the, the 12, 13 out of 16 marks point system. All right, we're going on to another example. All right. Are you ready for the answer? I'm going to flick to the next slide. Okay. And here is your answer. Can you ascertain how many of the rhythmic configurations here use only the three notes or pulses per beat? Did you work that out as you were listening to it? Right. Feel free to pause the clip here and review it if you need to. Good. On to the next slide. Right. This box here is just the same as what I showed you earlier on, except now I've highlighted those four configurations to give you sort of a visual reference point. All right. I hope that's useful for you. Right, we may in fact be ready for another example, so let us prepare ourselves for this. Very good, I hope that was manageable. Let us move on to the answer on the next slide. And here is your answer. That again is your counting bar. You've got triple T ta, triple T ta, ticka T T, ticka ticka T ta, ticka ticka tim, ka tim, ka ka tim, ticka T ta, ta ka mi ta. Okay, that's just a very brief little example of me performing 
this rhythm with rhythm names, you need to be doing that as much as possible. Once you've got these answers in place, I'd copy them out, write the rhythm names down underneath and practice. Practice to your heart's content, all right? So you're getting really solid and secure. The body seems to need the physical practice to absorb the oral talent or skill that you need to acquire here. So it's that, that physical, kinesthetic, tactile thing you've got to do with your learning here. It's really important. Don't skip it, right? Right. Let's move on. Right. We are now going to look at something different. It is not the brief of this presentation to discuss the difference between simple time signatures and compound duple time signatures. There's heaps of information out on the internet. Go and look it up for yourself. Right. What you just need to understand for now is that the basic beat unit is now a dotted crotchet. You know that when you add a dot after a note, as you have here, you add on half the original value. So your original crotchet beat that you've been so conditioned to work with, <laughs> right across probably year eight music, year nine, ten, and maybe even year seven, if you're lucky to get all those year levels of music in a high school, um, we're often conditioned to work with just two beats, two, two pulses or two sounds per beat. That's the crotchet beat. And we're not as quick to get on to the uh, dotted crotchet beat. So students sort of flounder with this compound time signature for a little while until they get the hang of it. What I'm going to say to you here is I'm dropping you in the deep end. There is no other way of doing it. You need to just become familiar with these configurations. Your dotted crotchet beat is now your basic beat unit. That beat unit equals that. You can get lots of different combinations and permutations here. These aren't all of them. They're the majority of the ones that you'll come across in a compound time signature, of course. But you've got your three quavers are equal to the dotted quaver here. Can you see how we group in threes now, not in twos? All right. Now, instead of having four semiquavers, you've now got six semiquavers, right? So there's two ways of thinking about rhythmic transcription. Um, in a compound time signature, you can think in terms of the dotted crotchet beat or you can pulse according to the six quaver beats in the bar, right, if you're dealing with 6-8, because I know already in advance that your examples that I'm going to provide here for you are in 6-8. So you could use your rhythmic transcription stick notation device thing again and you can put six pulses above each bar if that's going to help you and you can listen to what you're going to hear for each pulse and transcribe that way. If you're a little bit more advanced, you might be confident using a, a, the dotted crotchet uh, beat above the bar if that's something you want to do. All right. Now, for the purpose of the next example, I'm really only going to pick a choice off the first line and the first rhythmic configuration off the second line. I do have a second PowerPoint presentation which has more information and further explanation about these figures so I encourage you to have a look at that one as well there's heaps more examples of rhythmic dictation there as well too so please do practice them come back to them repeatedly and you should be practicing your um, downloadable VCE exams as well from the VCAR site too so let's get going with the next slide Good. Now, if that sample thoroughly bamboozled you, one of the reasons it might have bamboozled you is because our counting is quite different now. And you'll see this when you finally get over to the uh, answer for this particular sample. Instead of having a counting of one, two, three, four, you will usually, if you're working in six, eight, for example, you'll have a counting of one, two, three, four. Five, six, or if you're in nine, eight, it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so don't let this confuse you, right? You're now dealing with a basic beat unit that involves a dotted crotchet. Let's go to the next slide and have a look at the answer there. Oh, fancy pants transition. Excellent. Here's our answer. That was your counting bar, and you can see that I've had to change the tempo to get this to work right on this presentation. 
So these, this to me was quite an easy transcription. Like you have, here's your counter, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and you've got your group of three quavers followed by the dotted crotchet. Same thing again, repeated. Music is built on lots and lots of repetition. So you've got two of the same configurations here and your group of six semiquavers plus your dotted crotchet. Right, if you're new to 6-8 or compound time signatures, I can understand and appreciate this would have been quite tricky to begin with, right? You now need to be thinking in a different way. If you didn't get much of this sample correct, there will be further examples to work from in future presentations. One more for now, though, and after, after which we will conclude this particular presentation. Please do review everything you've done. Please make sure you're giving yourself the mark out of 16. So if, if, still imagining that each bar is worth four counts, right? And imagining that each sample therefore is worth 16 counts. Give yourself a mark out of 16, right? Good. I hope that was easy to hear. Final slide. And here's our answer. For some reason, a couple of my notes in MuseScore haven't quite worked. I couldn't alter that for some reason. It went grey. I have to have a look into that. It's just a little sort of bit useful. And I, I knew why an early example had a blue note. I had just done a cut and paste when I was still partly in play mode. So these funny things come to descend upon us. All right, so that is your answer. Good. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next presentation I've got going because I've got some more six, eight compound duple types of examples and I've got further explanations about how all these note values work for you. All right, but please do get into and onto your VC music books. I find that it's wonderful to have these kind of, you know, talked through presentations with teachers in the background. Um, but your, your VC music workbooks are generally quite sound with the content there. And I find one of the biggest problems is students just aren't doing enough work from them. Please complete every exercise. Be meticulous. That's how you improve your skills. You must try to acquire those skills and I know we're in difficult times at the moment but I can't stress enough working quietly and conscientiously and fully immersing yourself in these tasks you improve by constant immersion every day a little bit every day can help don't forget I don't have it um, officially in this presentation but there's a very good website called teoria.com I get my guys to use that when they've run out of everything else Teoria.com, you can create your own um, intervallic recognition exercises and practice modes and all that sort of thing too. All right. Just by way of goodbye here, this might seem a little bit irrelevant, but I just wanted to explain something here. Here's your traditional syncopal, syncopated rhythm here. You've got a quaver followed by a crotchet followed by a quaver. When you have a look at this one, this one, the taka me configuration or the taka ka configuration, it is essentially um, half time and therefore double the speed. This is a technique in music uh, that we talk about. We say that this configuration has been, um, it has participated in a process of rhythmic diminution, which means shortening, right? You can also do rhythmic augmentation. And you can also do melodic diminution and melodic augmentation. These are compositional devices. You might be sitting here thinking, you know, why is she talking this up at the end of this presentation? But if you look in the VCAR study design, you will see the term compositional devices used all over the document. They don't necessarily always provide specific examples. But again, there are resources around. If you look and search around on the internet, you will be able to find compositional devices. What I'm trying to do here is just by way of a, a brief reflection is to get you to think about how the Takami configuration has arisen. It's actually a half-time version of this configuration and this is a technique, a compositional device we use as musicians. We make music this way. We repeat rhythms that 
twice the length that they would normally be performed or we perform them and repeat them at half time, you know, half the length that they would normally uh, take to be performed. So I was just talking about a process of rhythmic diminution slash rhythmic augmentation can also be applied to melodic diminution and melodic augmentation. Okay, just bear that in mind. I'm trying to get you to relate your learning to other concepts. Okay, everyone, that concludes this presentation. I hope to see you join me for another one soon. Thank you.